So George Lakoff is a famous cognitive linguist, and he's he probably has done the most work on this, uh, the most influential academic researcher on this. And he has this thing called a truth sandwich. And he said that uh, people who want to uh, uh, pursue progressive causes, because he's a progressive, but it works for anybody, you've got to think about the truth sandwich. And so you never start by attacking what you consider to be the lie. You never state the lie first. You always state, in entering an argument, you always state the truth. So the government can never run out of money. And then, once you've framed the discussion with the truth, you can then go back and discuss the attempt to divert the truth. So you can then talk about the mainstream in our context of economics. And then you always have to finish an arc, a, a discussion by returning to the truth because you can never allow the, di the diversion or distraction to work. So you sandwich the lie in between the truth. So when you're discussing things at the dinner tables or down the pub if you can get over the noise or wherever, think about the truth sandwich. It's, it's, it's absolutely essential analytical device uh, in framing language. Because otherwise you, this is trying to address cognitive dissonance, otherwise you'll never get cut through. Now here's George. And uh, a fundamental principle of the research that he's developed is uh, denying a frame activates the frame. A frame is a, is a, a conceptual structure by which we attach meaning to the world. It's the way we, under, we think we understand things. And if you try to deny a frame, you'll just activate it. This is the research literature. Now what does that mean? Here's an example of negating a frame. <laughs> For those who are old enough, we'll know yeah. Watergate. And Richard Nixon on that date came out and gave a very, at the height of the sort of uh, attempt to derail him and impeach him. He was trying to defend him in the last days of his defence. He made this address on TV. That was that was a picture drawn, captured from an address. And he came at one stage and said, "I am not a crook." So the frame was that he was a crook, and he was trying to negate it. And all he did was reinforced the fact that everybody thought he was a crook. What did he say? I am a crook. So often we try to negate, we try to use negation of frames in our discussions, as I'll show you, and it's not the way to argue or to construct a, a discussion. So here's an example. Progressives like to say, no tax cuts for the rich. We don't want the rich to get tax cuts. And, and implicitly they believe, of course, that that will reduce the amount of uh, uh, ca the capacity of government to do progressive things like public health and stuff. And all that no tax cuts for the rich, we know chant uh, rallies and stuff, or go, uh, progressive politicians go on TV and say, we don't want any tax cuts for the rich. We want them to pay their way. What that activates is that phone. No tax cuts for the rich just immediately activates in our, the way we understand things, the way uh, the, the cognition works. It activates that frame. Now, what's the problem with that? Being rich is an aspiration. We all, we all aspire, you know, implicitly to be better off in material terms than we, the, uh, we are now. Because our society has that aspiration is our path to success. 
And that's the way typically will construct success. I'm not saying everybody thinks like this, but this would be a common sentiment. Now, what, what happens there? Well, the conservatives on, in the debate always use what's called the tax relief throne. We want tax relief. That's how the conservatives discuss. Let's have tax cuts, tax relief. And what that invokes is a bad, we understand that taxes are bad, and that we want relief from a bad. So it's an incredibly powerful frame to present to the public because it's reinforcing good and good overcoming bad. And so you've got this message in conflict. The left think that taxes permit spending on good things. So they say no tax cuts for rich so the government will have more money. And the right say taxes take money from hard work and give it to those who don't work. And we want tax relief from that. And the reality is that both of those frames reinforce the conservative frame because of the, the, the progressives negate and negate and therefore reinforce the frame that taxes are bad and we don't want them, they're, they're an impingement to our aspirations and the right say tax relief, getting rid of the bad. It's a really powerful demonstration of how you present your arguments. Negating a frame will reinforce it every time. Don't use language, because the, don't use their language. So if you're trying to oppose something, you've got to break away from the language that's common to, that they're using. Because all you do is you'll pick out their frame. So what's an example for that one? So could you say taxes don't pay for public safety? Here's an example. So I'm doing an interview for Bloomberg or something, and uh, or conservative media outlet, and they say to me, well, are you in favour of tax relief or not? Now, as soon as I say no, I reinforce the throne. So the way, and I'm using their language. So what I've got to do is divert, divert it into different frames with different language. So when I'm asked by an interviewer all the time, you know, am I in favour of tax relief? If I fall into the trap and say, well, no, I'm not really in favour of cutting taxes for the rich because they've got, uh, sorry, yeah, because they've got too much money already and all the rest of the sort of uh, progressive motherhood sort of statements that uh, Labor politicians use all the time. What I'll say, because I'm smart and I know, understand framing, is that I'll, I'll be asked that question and then I'll answer no, I'm in favour of the government having to provide first class education and healthcare. I've diverted the frame. Now the frame is about government provision of good stuff. And I've taken it away from the arguments relating that to taxes. And you, you know, you sit in, you sit, hold on, you sit in, uh, you watch. Uh, politicians being interviewed on current affairs programs and stuff and you get so frustrated because they never answer the question. Well, that's because they know all this stuff. They're not going to get trapped into a frame that they don't want to. They, they want to create their own frame. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Jessica, I'm wondering though, isn't it different that it's a, you know, isn't it, even this answer, isn't that even if you're enforcing the message that the dark section pays for those things, Directly, isn't that kind of saying that that space that we are admitting that yeah. that space for those things? Yeah, it's reinforcing all the things that that frame invokes. That's a frame, tax relief. A, a, a good thing reducing a bad. And and under under pin un, you know associated with that frame 
is all these other, all these propositions. The taxpayers fund government spending and all of this stuff. You're taking money off those who work hard and giving to those who don't. All of the welfare sort of stuff. So you don't want to buy, as a progressive, you don't want to buy into any of that because if you try to negate it, you'll just reinforce it. So for, for MMT, of course, this is the dissonance argument. We're up against a really powerful set of frames that uh, uh, reinforce cognition that's completely the opposite to the way MMT thinks. So that's our challenge, and that's why I'm doing this work. So here's a few few further pointers in trying to redress or address that dissonance. You should never start an argument. This is again from the research literature. Never start an argument with the facts. So you never go and say, "Oh, unemployment sort of thirteen percent is too high." That's it's factual, but it won't win the argument because then you because people will un, uh, interpret that fact within their frame. So yeah, there's thirty percent of people who are too lazy to work. So you've lost the argument. So what you've got to start off with is a what's called in the, this cognitive literature a destination. You've got to start framing your discussions initially in destinations. Because we all love getting somewhere. I'm going to New York tomorrow, I'll be very happy when I get there. And so the destination that you start with should encapsulate our conceptions of that we can all agree to of social purpose and aspiration and all of that. And then you can start talking in terms of, well, what do we want the economy to do for us? How is, it, how is the, eco the economy going to allow us to reach that destination? And the way in which you express the destination has to be in a way that triggers positive frames that you can then extrapolate to support your argument. That's very tricky. And then you can start talking about the facts because then you can say, oh yeah, but this, we've got too many, we're not going to be able to achieve our destination because we haven't got enough people working. Rather than start bemoaning that you haven't got people working from the beginning and triggering all the negative stuff that we've been led to think about unemployment, laziness, not searching enough, you express that in terms of a failure to achieve a destination you establish as being desirable. And uh, you know, some years ago there was a group of mayors, cross political, not a, a national party and a Labor Party, so normally we wouldn't talk to each other, uh, who were sick to death of the effect in their local areas of the austerity that the national government was pushing on. To them as part of the whole neoliberal agenda, and they formed a, gov a mayor's task force for jobs. It was an unbelievably innovative uh, event, uh, venture and cooperation. And they had the grand purpose zero waste of New Zealand. It was a terrific social purpose. And it immediately framed, the, framed their activities and everything they did in terms of zero waste. We love that. We don't want waste. And we certainly don't want our people wasted. And so then they could get down to discussions about facts and stuff. Now you also need, in, in, the, in this literature, there's a concept called event causation structures. So you actually have to link your destination to some events and some causation. And so here's an example of a broad destination, jobs for all. Now, unless you believe in UBI, then everybody likes jobs for all. But that's just an event, a destination. There's no causation in that statement. 
So a right winger can say, yeah, we want jobs for all, that's a great thing to achieve, but we'll do it by uh, uh, incentivising private markets and deregulating and getting more activity there and uh, cutting wages and getting everybody to, to be more incentivised. So that doesn't do it. You've got to attach a desirable causation to that because this is their causation, deregulation, privatisation. So your grand social purpose gets hijacked. So here's, an, here's how you can progress there. You have to add an appropriate action that has a causation to it. And so here's an example. We want jobs for all, everybody agrees with that. <coughs> Which means that aggregate spending in the economy has to rise by X percent to generate Y million jobs. So you immediately got the, the broad social purpose frame attached to a causation structure. It's we have to create jobs. Now, then you reinforce, then the causation structure becomes, you have to make that evident. How do you get that aggregate spending to generate the jobs? Well, you get it through government deficits. So you've got the purpose, the event creating the work, and the causation that will create the work, government spending above taxes, stimulus. So it's purpose, event, causation, action statements. And every time you frame a statement, you have to have those components in it. You can't just go and walk down the street, jobs for all, when do we want it? We want it now, that sort of stuff. That doesn't that just reinforces frames that you don't want to reinforce. So some points on language. This is really this is really the difficult part. Because, for example, in that past, uh, previous example, we said, you know, that we wanted the government to spend X million dollars to create whatever jobs we wanted to, for jobs for all. But the, 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 that invokes, the, the term spent, for example, invokes negative frames. Because, you know, in English language, spent means you you know, this morning I ran 10k and I was spent. I was tired because I'd been uh, exercising and so I'd left, left my glycogen in my muscles behind the, on the running track. I'd spent, spent my energy. That's, that's a bad thing. <coughs> and so the alternative, the alternative is that I might say government invests in X million dollars because this is an example in our we use these metaphors from a very early age. The cognitive uh, linguists tell you that we have an embodied conception of mind and body in the way we understand reality. And we use metaphors that invoke physical as well as mental constructs as a way of creating meaning to our external world. So a really key metaphor we use and you might be aware of it, but we're using it all the time, is this more is up metaphor. So we attach a quantity with a vertical distance, vertical direction. So if something's going up, we think that's more and that's good. If something's going down, we immediately think it's less and that's bad. And that's, you know, that's, that's this, this is embedded in the research literature. It's a really powerful thing about our cognition. That it's all it's all subconscious. We don't we don't know we're doing all of this, but that's what we're doing. And so invest is building up. More is up. We we attach that to be a good thing, whereas spending is with the reverse of more is up. And that's something not very good. And the more, the more is up works in reverse. And this is where it gets even trickier. Because we might say that uh, we need a larger deficit to accomplish the jobs for all. 
And so larger would typically be more is up good. But the language then triggers the reverse of more is up because more in this case is actually worse because we're saying deficit, which is a shortfall. Really tricky. Yeah, works deficits we consider to be bad. There's a shortfall, we're running out. And the other reason I never use the word budget, unless I put it in inverted commas, is because it triggers the household metaphor. And whenever you're talking about the more is up metaphor, and you're constructing it in an event structure that I talked about before, purpose, event, action, causality, you know, destination, you always have to link the purposes that you're, you're talking about with destinations. The destination must always be prominent and you can, you can modify our reaction to the more is up metaphor that why that triggers our frames by adding a, an appropriate destination. So for example, the government deficit rose. So that statement up to there would trigger the reverse more is up metaphor in our, in our cognition. But then if you add a, a desirable destination and generated higher levels of wealth for households and firms, that's the way of dealing with that sort of cognitive trap. Yeah? You have to use the deficit and just say the government spending growth generates higher levels of wealth. Well, see, so spending is, a, is the same as a deficit. It's a, it's a negative connotation. And so what this, this statement does, and this is the further principle that's in the literature, is the concept of forced movement. Okay, you establish a destination that, that you know that we want to get to that's it's desirable, and you've then got to uh, relate that destination to something that's going to get you there. You won't get there unless there's a force operating to move you to there. And so in this context, The causes are forces and the causation are forced. And so in this case the example we've given is that we, we want to disabuse people of thinking that things just happen, that the market does stuff, you know, that if we just leave it alone it'll, it'll happen. And so in this case we want to encourage people to understand that we need government action to actually force movement to our desired destination. So here's some research, about three minutes. It's definitely not, and, and this is not my research, this is my understanding of the experts who have done research on this. It's not a debating medium. It's a really poor medium for debating. And so I see there's countless debates, there's one at the moment going on about UBI and I just keep getting copied into them, it's just sickening. There's a phenomenon called compassion fatigue. And that is that we, we initially might be really concerned that there's poverty rising. But if we keep getting told about it, about bad things, we become inured to it. And so the message just becomes powerless. So if you think you're doing a good job out there by tweeting every day how bad austerity is, well then you're actually doing a bad job. You will be invoking what's called compassion fatigue and you, and you may as well just not send the tweets. And what Twitter has been found to be suitable for is this third point. It's extremely suitable for leading a reader to a preferred external source of information. That's what it's suitable for. But moreover, and this is the thing that really, really interested me when I sort of was reading all this literature, the, the next thing is really fantastic. Because if you learn to frame your tweet correctly, the tweet that refers a person to an external report or a, you know, something, a bit of information, 
then you can actually, if you if you if you word the tweet properly, you can actually condition the way in which the person reads that report. You can frame frame them in a in a way that they'll read the report in a way that you want them to read it in a sympathetic way. That's incredible in my view. And that's why the, the Twitters have, the tweets have to be really worded carefully if you want him to refer a person to an external report. Because you can get the way that you can condition the way they receive that report. And so you could get a person who had views that were, were at odds with your views, and you refer them to an external report that gives reinforces your views and you can get them to read that report in your frame, not their frame. And here's an example. So the, the, this is a typical tweet that said, local community faces 10% unemployment, parents cannot feed their children, Tories to blame. Compassion fatigue. Just wash it off. It's not. It's a waste of time. Whereas if you say economy needs more jobs, so you try to get the same message. The economy needs more jobs to bolster incomes and sales. Government stimulus created X million jobs during the GFC. See this article with a link. So they've already been framed to think that the government created the jobs and that that reduced that reduced uh, that increased income and activity. Whereas this first one just washes away. The last slide is the difference between what, what are called structural and individual frames. And so whenever I talk, you'll, you, whenever I say talk about unemployment, I always say it's a systemic shortage, uh, a systemic failure of the economy to produce enough jobs. That's a structural statement. A systemic failure. It's the system failure. The economy to produce enough jobs. And that's juxtaposed with an individual frame. So, for example, if you frame poverty structurally, then people assign responsibility to society at large. Whereas if you frame it individually, so often you'll see on TV or or, or in the media, uh, case studies of a, a really disadvantaged single mum or something who's just lost their job, got four kids, uh, poverty, hopeless situation. And while that might be very well meaning, it's framing the problem as, a, as an individual problem. And <coughs> The cognition, our cognition, will be triggered. Will be triggered to then assigning the responsibility of that person's state to them. Whereas that person is not poor because of them. That's not what you want people to believe. They might. That's not what you want people to think. But you've used an individual frame rather than a structural frame of that problem. Poverty is because there's not enough jobs in the economy. It's a systemic failure. And that's the solution to poverty. So it's got nothing to do with the individual particularly. Right, so that's uh, the end. <laughs>